Welcome to Free Thought Matters. I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're the executive directors of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which works to keep religion out of government and to educate you, the public, on matters relating to non-theism, atheism, agnosticism, skepticism, and humanism. And we'd be pleased to send you a complimentary issue of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Recent events show how vital this work is, and we'd love to have you join us at ffrf.org. Today, our guest is Sakivu Hutchinson, founder of Black Skeptics Los Angeles and a feminist, novelist, playwright, and director. She's also founder of the Women's Leadership Project, a mentoring and civic engagement program for South Los Angeles girls of color. She's been named 2020 Harvard Humanist of the Year and will be receiving FFRF's Free Thought Heroine Award at our next national convention. Sakibu Hutchinson's many books and plays include Moral Combat, Black Atheists, Gender Politics, and the Values War, and White Knights, Black Paradise, about the Reverend Jim Jones. We've invited Sakibu Hutchinson on Free Thought Matters to talk about a number of issues concerning gender and social justice from a black feminist perspective, and especially to talk about her newest book, it's called Humanists in the Hood, Unapologetically Black, Feminist, and Heretical. Thank you for joining us today, Sakivu. Thank you. Good to be here. So I understand that you attended a Catholic school, a, I think a girls' school. Is that what turned you into an atheist <laughs> and a feminist? <laughs> um, that was a catalyst, but it was not the initial catalyst. Um, I grew up in a secular humanist household. So my parents were free thinkers. They were heavily involved in black liberation struggle organizing and journalism and public media. And so that was really the backdrop to my upbringing vis-a-vis -vis my free thinking critical consciousness as an African-American feminist rejecting official dogma from religious and Christian idolatry specifically in our community. So when you mentioned the, the Catholic experience, that fortunately was one year of my life, <laughs> a traumatic year, I might add, <laughs> of uh, really being immersed in the, the demonization of humanism and atheism and nonconformity, more to the point, as a young person. So that was definitely a seminal time in terms of making me very conscious of the need to champion quite unequivocally the right for young people to express and espouse humanist beliefs. So a lot of people, Sakivu, think that black Americans, or if I can use the word people of color, or whatever terms we're using right now. Uh, African Americans. African Americans and other minorities. Uh, a lot of people think that they're all religious, they're all gospel singers and churchgoers, but you know that that's not true, right? Well, let me qualify that. African Americans are predominantly religious. 87% of African American women, for example, are religiously identified. And African Americans certainly, if we look at the demographics in the United States, have some of the highest rates of religious observance. That being said, there has, throughout African-American social history and American history in general, been um, a very critical and very vocal African-American humanist and free-thinking population, stemming all the way back to the times of enslavement. So it's important to qualify that categorical assumption that all African-Americans are religiously identified and to really look at the way in which, as I do in Humanists in the Hood, these traditions of black liberation struggle have been informed by social justice, um, self-determination with regard to humanist beliefs and humanist movement organizing. So for example, we can look at folks like Frederick Douglass and his absolutely unequivocal critique of the hypocrisy of Christian dogma and Christian idolatry when it came to black enslavement and white supremacy. 
we can look at folks like uh, the organizer A. Philip Randolph, who all the way back in the 1930s, with his seminal journal, The Messenger, sponsored this amazing contest called, Is Christianity a Menace to the Negro? Mm -hmm. And so he was framing that not only in terms of pushing back against white supremacist idolatry and its nexus with Christian nationalism, but he was also looking at it in terms of ways that black churches siphon critical funds and critical resources and multi-generational wealth from impoverished African-American communities. So those are the precursors to contemporary 21st century African-American humanist social thought. So why humanists in the hood? What does humanism have to offer black folks? So let's go back to your previous question about me coming up as this ninth grader in the turbulence of Catholic dogma and Catholic idolatry. What I wanted to foreground and what I, I really highlight in the first chapter is my coming into wisdom and coming into consciousness as a young person, African-American girl in a working class to middle class, urban, predominantly black community. And there not being any visible beyond my parents, beyond our immediate family, guidepost to African-American humanism in terms of you know folks that were actively identified as humanists. But at the same time, we were living humanist values. We were living the values of really valuing social justice and gender justice and bodily autonomy for African-American girls and feminist and womanist principles of reproductive justice and feminist and womanist principles of trying to uplift educational justice and equity for African-American youth in K through 12 apartheid schools. That is the seminal dynamic in Humanists in the Hood, trying to weave in all of those threads and really pushing back against Eurocentric traditions of humanism that are absolutely not steeped in consciousness of the hierarchies that exist in American society when it comes to the fact that African Americans continue to be the most segregated racial demographic in the U.S., continue to have the least wealth in the U.S. when we're looking at this supposedly post-Jim Crow, post-apartheid era, uh, continue to have the least access to jobs, to housing, to equitable education, to reproductive health and reproductive rights. So these are the primary themes that I foreground in Humanists in the Hood. And again, in contravention of in, in pushback and resistance to white supremacist humanist traditions and atheist traditions. So, feminism. I read in your book, Humanists in the Hood, wonderful book, by the way, that uh, some or maybe most black women are uncomfortable with feminism because they view it as a white thing. Is that true? Historically, that's been true, and again, I need to invoke a caveat that there have always been black women on the front lines of feminist resistance movement. In the book, I talk about Anna Julia Cooper, uh, who was a, a seminal black feminist thinker when it came to really framing black women's self-determination, pushing back against respectability politics, pushing back against uh, heteronormative and patriarchal norms of femininity that straightjacketed black women. At the same time, the feminist movement, and, and certainly the first wave and the second wave feminist movements, have been very hostile to the kinds of ideology that black feminists and black womanist thinkers have posited in terms of pushing back against white supremacy. So if we look at, for example, um, seminal feminist free thinkers like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Christian white feminists like Susan B. Anthony, who were championing a kind of white women's nationalist ideology when it came to 
the right to vote, that these women consider themselves to be abolitionists. They consider themselves to be on the front lines of, of trying to align with black self-determination and black liberation. But when it came to championing the 15th Amendment that would confer African-American men and other men of color with the right to vote, with the suffrage, these women were invoking very nativist, very nationalist, very xenophobic and racist rhetoric in their subscription to universal suffrage and saying that we as white women should get the vote before the primitive, unwashed, and uncivilized men of color. And so it was that type of dynamic that really established a template for this paradox of white women's feminism, the fact that white women consider themselves, again, to be allies with African Americans, to be allies with the enslaved African um, American abolitionist movement leaders, but at the same time were, were quite frontal in putting forward their plea and, and their resistance movement as prioritizing white femininity. And so that particular current continues to inform contemporary feminism. So um, and certainly, if you look at the second wave women's movement, when we're talking about, for example, the candidacy of Shirley Chisholm and the disengagement of mainstream white women in the women's movement, those are the kinds of dynamics that have really unsettled African-American feminists and other feminists of color. Well, I can tell you one thing. I was, I think, 13 or 14 when my mother took me to a fundraiser and I got to meet Shirley Chisholm, so I was thrilled. She was thrilled. So, Sakivu, given this history, what does feminism offer black women and why be a feminist? Can you make a case for that? So in the book, I talk about the example of the Kami River Collective. And the Kami River Collective was um, a 1970s resistance movement that was initiated by African-American lesbians on the East Coast. And again, it was quite frontal in staking out a claim in feminism against white supremacist feminism in the second wave women's movement. We have to take a break, and when we come back, we want to talk more about the humanist obligation to, um, to work on lifting up everybody and some of the things that you are doing um, through Black Skeptics Los Angeles and as a mentor, and also the ethical foundations um, rather than the supernatural foundations of how we should live. So we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist, and I'm alarmed by the intrusions of religion into our secular government. That's why I'm asking you to support the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics, working to keep state and church separate, just like our founding fathers intended. Please support the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Jarvis and I'm an out-of-the-closet atheist. There are many reasons why I'm an atheist, but I'll start with the crudest explanation. I'm sure many of you have seen Clash of the Titans or The Immortals or 300, these blockbuster films about ancient Greek or Roman religion, which we now call mythology. But back then it wasn't mythology. It was very real for them. They genuinely believed that you had to put a coin in a person's mouth before they were buried so that they could pay for the literal ferry to the afterlife. Just as many people today believe that they should eat crackers and wine on a Sunday or that God wants women to hide their bodies under black burqas. Every religion that has ever existed, and there are many, have all believed that they were right, that their rituals and rules and beliefs were 100% correct. And they all thought they nailed it. But where are they today? Uh, if they're not completely forgotten, they're on the silver screen, amusing us with their sword fights, animal sacrifices, and oracles. The religions of today are the entertainment of tomorrow. Everyone, I hope, is an atheist about Zeus and Apollo, Juno and Poseidon. I just added Jesus and Muhammad to that list. 
Thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. You can find more content by the Freedom From Religion Foundation at our website, ffrf.org. Follow FFRF on Facebook and you'll get notifications about all of our content, including whenever we go live on FFRF's Ask an Atheist. FFRF is also on YouTube, where all of our programs, including this show and our weekly news bites, are available to watch anytime. Thanks again for watching and we'll see you on the web. My name is Bill and I'm an out of the closet apatheist, meaning I don't really care what you believe and I don't really think that you should care what I believe. I was raised in South Dakota in a strict Catholic family. I was an altar boy. I served mass a lot of Sundays twice. We, the, the priest gave us this little card that said, in case of accident, please call a priest. I don't really like that idea anymore since I left the church about 40 years ago. Now, if you find me alongside the road after an accident, please call an ambulance and an EMT. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with Sakivu Hutchinson, author of the book, Humanists in the Hood. And Sakivu, we want to talk about ethics and ethics without God and so on. But before we do that, I did want to talk a little bit about the play that you have written, uh, White Nights, um, uh, Black Paradise, about the uh, Jonestown Massacre and the fact that most of those 900 people who were killed or forced to drink cyanide were black people, many of them children. And why do you remain interested in the history of this and what's so important about that? When I first began my journey researching People's Temple, which was the church involved in the Jonestown Massacre of 1978, I was stunned by the fact that that church was predominantly African-American, 75% African-American. And it really bothered me that there really had not been any reckoning with the impact of the loss of African-American lives and the impetus for African-Americans' involvement in that movement. And so as I began to dig deeper and see that Black women were pivotal to that movement, were the backbone of that movement, were providing it with its sweat equity and with its funding and with its momentum, that grabbed and intrigued me all the more. Because most of the mythology that I had consumed, as per so many other folks, had led me to believe that this was a white person's movement, that it was powered by the charisma of Jim Jones, and that the folks that ran over to Guyana were crazy, that they were crackpots, that they were bug-eyed acolytes. And so I wanted to debunk that in White Nights, Black Paradise within novel form, because as you are aware, you know, coming from that era, there have been so many nonfiction accounts and representations of that trajectory, and close to none that come from an African-American yeah. feminist perspective. And so that was really my charge, to, to unpack the significance, the political and cultural significance of this movement from a Black feminist perspective, to contextualize it in terms of all of the socio-political turbulence that was transpiring during that era, and to give voice and validation to the trajectories of black women who were involved in that movement. And it certainly is, uh, it shows the menace of Christianity to black Americans, to use Mr. Phillips' words. One point on that, one caveat that's really intriguing about the trajectory of People's Temple is that it was a syncretic, if you will, movement, that it pulled together a lot of different elements, not just Pentecostal Christianity, but secularism and atheism and other strands of faith. So that also intrigued me, that you had African-American secular folks that were, that were within that movement that perceived People's Temple as being an antidote to Christian yeah. idolatry. So you started a group, Black Skeptics LA, and your book is called Humanists in the Hood. 
what is humanism? And if, you, if you're not religious, how can you be a good person? Humanism is a secular belief system based upon the privileging of secular ethics, which means that as humanists, we do not subscribe to the omniscience and the omnipotence of supernatural beings. We believe that ethics, morals, and justice flow from human beings. We subscribe to the Big Bang Theory, and we subscribe to the theory of evolution. If we want to drill down and be constructed from a Black liberation and a Black feminist perspective, a radical humanist belief system is predicated on the notion that Eurocentric and white supremacist ideals of personhood, of civilization, of subjectivity have really been corrosive and insidious to African-American self-determination. And so when you pose the question about how we can be good without God, an African-American radical humanist perspective examines the degree to which these supernatural formulations of beingness, of morality, have really emanated from very hierarchical and very destructive Eurocentric ideals of what it means to be good, of what it means to be moral. And so we want to reclaim morality, ethics, and justice from an Afrocentric perspective and a feminist and womanist perspective and really ground it in the here and now in terms of organizing, in terms of political agency, in terms of liberation of young people, for example, from the apartheid carceral state that disproportionately locks up scores and scores of African-American youth and forecloses the possibility of them going on to higher ed and achieving living wage jobs and professional acquisition. So these are some of, of the primary tenets and themes within African-American radical humanist belief systems. So Sakivu, you um, push this idea that humanists have a moral obligation to fight for economic justice. And I'd like to talk a little br bit briefly about what you are doing through Black Skeptics Los Angeles and through mentoring to, um, to provide economic justice. You're doing very practical things. Right. So going back to the, the prior point that I made about making this connection between humanism and educational justice and, and redressing the extreme wounds of economic and educational apartheid, we instituted the First in the Family Humanist Scholarship in 2013 as a concerted effort to dismantle and to disrupt this regime of African-American youth and other youth of color being pipelined disproportionately into juvenile detention and to adult prisons. And so it was really, as I mentioned, a concerted effort to build resources within the Black humanist and Black skeptic community and to pipeline it into this program, not just for one-off scholarships, but also into other programs, into civic engagement, into mentoring, into advocacy, into a STEM orientation. And these are things that we've been developing for the past seven, eight years in partnership with organizations like FFRF. We're very grateful uh, to have that connection and to build on that for, what, six some odd years now, and other community-based organizations like Black Nonbelievers, um, like the Black Humanist and uh, Non-Believer Organization in Sacramento and other individuals nationwide. Well, we're very grateful that you're doing this work and to be able to work with you. And we just have a couple minutes left. You also do mentoring of young women um, in high schools. And just briefly, uh, there's a humanist element to that as well, isn't there? Yeah, so this goes back to the point about bodily autonomy and self-determination and reproductive justice, that the Women's Leadership Project, which is a black feminist civic engagement and mentoring program that's based in South LA, primarily for high school students. And we're also branching out to serve middle school students as well as our college alum 
the primary focus is a feminist and humanist curriculum that develops young women of color in terms of their critical thinking, their analytical skills, their collaboration skills, and their organizational skills. Doing projects and initiatives in the community that focus on mental health and wellness resilience and providing reproductive health resources, HIV AIDS, education prevention, and sexual violence and sexual harassment, harassment prevention education for young women and girls. Training them to do peer education, to do media, to publish, to write, to speak, to organize conferences. And we're also launching a task force that specifically focuses on the impact of the COVID pandemic on African-American girls. Well, we... So these are some of the things that uh, we've launched really over the past uh, decade and a half with Women's Leadership Project. Well, um, it's a terrific start. And Sakivu Hutchinson, we really look forward to seeing you in person when this pandemic is over and naming you our humanist heroine at our next convention, whenever we can meet again safely. And we really appreciate you joining us today and all of your work to promote humanism and feminism to the black community as, as well as to other people of color. It's a great work, so thank you. Thank you, pleasure to be here. And thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. Hi, I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.